Call the meeting to order at 7.05. Uh, 2.0 adjustments to the agenda. Are there any, is there a need for any adjustments? I'm going to leave my comments about the convention. About the, oh, about the convention. Okay. So we can get rid of 5.3. Um, thank you. Anything else? All right, 3.0, audience and communication. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks for coming. Uh, 4.0, presentations. 4.1, K2, academic program. And I guess this is Greg's show. That's me. Okay, so this is the first and what I think we could call a series of presentations around the board outcome of Robust Academic Foundation. And um, the focus of tonight's presentation is around the kindergarten through second grade academic program. So obviously everything we do comes through the lens of our CCS mission, which I'll just leave up there for 20 seconds or so, we can review. smiling faces from earlier in the year. Thought it would be good to do a little bit of an overview around the Common Core, since that is definitely a driver of our programmatic work these days. So this is just a quick um, glance at the adoption, it's an adoption map here. All the states in the lighter shade are states that have adopted the Common Core. Um, these are national standards that are st uh, replacing the Vermont GEs. And essentially Common Core standards define the knowledge and skills students should have uh, within their K-12 education so that they graduate high school able to succeed in entry level, credit bearing, academic college courses, and in workforce training programs. And essentially the Common Core, the creation of the Common Core was a response to an outcry based on research, based on um, employers, based on even the military, saying um, universities, saying that students coming out of high school, there was a tremendous gap between what they were doing in high school in terms of rigor and complexity and what was expected in terms of um, ability to read and comprehend and analyze, synthesize complex text um, technical texts and the group of educators um, who put the Common Core Standards basically work backwards from what is expected to be successful in a workforce, even entry level or credit bearing college work and let's work backwards from 12th grade to kindergarten make sure kids have the skills to do that. So this is not something that's just coming out of thin air. It's been um, a transition timeline since 2010. That arrow indicates where we are there. And essentially, we have now aligned curriculum um, with the Common Core. We have aligned classroom assessments. And uh, our school accountability is still based on NECAP. You'll see the difference between phase four, full implementation, is all our instruction our curriculum, our assessments, including school-wide implementation, the school-wide accountability, is then moving over to SBAC. And I'll talk a little bit more about SBAC. This is the local version <coughs> of this same idea. And this really um, illustrates how thoughtful um, the SU has been about approaching the Common Core. And um, I'm happy to say that we're right on track under Molly. Molly's leadership um, in terms of where we are in building our knowledge and understanding of what the Common Core shifts are going to be. So we're right there in the, the fourth of the fifth year in implementation. And again, I'll get a little bit more into the pieces, the focus, the foci shifts in ELA and math later in the presentation. So big ideas from the Common Core, and for many of you, You've heard some of this before. But four big ideas here on this page 
although this is right out of the ELA section of the Common Core, these ideas can really cross across, across all the content there is. Now, students should be able to read complex texts. Not just read them, but understand them. And that there's a greater emphasis on informational text and informative writing. So text that informs the reader and writing that informs the reader. Students need to be able to evaluate and gather evidence. So when they're, when they're let's say, responding to a prompt, that they're not responding just based on their own experiences, but they're responding based on evidence that they're getting either from um, artifacts in the text or other evidence, charts, graphs, whatever. And that they can integrate information into clear, coherent writing that demonstrates critical thinking. And again, this, these are from the ELA section, but they cross over into other contexts. So just a little bit about SVAC. Again, I, I apologize for some repetition, but I think it's good to do an overview here. So SVAC stands for Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. And it will replace the NECAP assessments in language, language arts and um, mathematics as a summative um, standardized assessment for students grades three through 11. So our school accountability is, system basically moves over to SVAC. They're going to be administered for the first time next spring. These uh, are administered on computers. This is not a pencil and paper task. And that's across the board. And these assessments are standardized and personalized at the same time. So there's Excuse a- me. Next spring or the spring of 2015? 2015. The spring of 2015, I'm considering next spring to be the spring after this coming spring. So we just did the kneecaps in the fall? There won't be any kneecaps next fall. There's going to be a year and a half before we get to the next one. Exactly. Yep, about 15, 16 months from now. So they're standardized, but yes, yet there's an adaptive um, technology involved. So based on an answer a student gives on a particular question, the software will um, steer the student to another question based on the response to that question. So every student will have a different, slightly different testing experience. So obviously there are technology implications for kindergarten through second grade. Um, you know, what I'm thinking about, what we're thinking about is we want students in third grade who are gonna be taking this assessment for the very first time. The assessment's gonna look different, feel different from anything they've ever done other than the opportunity to take some practice assessments before then. We want them to be able to show what they know. And for students to be able to do that, especially our third graders, current second graders, um, the testing platform should not be a hindrance. So we don't want this experience to be about the platform. We don't want this experience to be about the computer. So we're asking ourselves the question, what instructional experiences with technology, hardware, and software do our current kindergarten through second grade students need to have so that they are able to show what they know in ELA and math in the spring of 2015? And that focus, that question is really the main focus of our local technology committee this year. And this is also a topic that we talked about a few days ago at the lead, the lead committee, at the lead meeting. Uh, this is a quote right out of the core, core about media and technology. And essentially, um, this runs throughout the core, and, and they're saying, just as media and technology are integrated in school and life in the 21st century, that the skills related to the media use and technology are integrated throughout the standards. Technology, media use, analysis of crit critical analysis of media uh, aren't looked at as discrete standards, but are instead um, integrated across different contents. So again, just wanted to drive home some of the tech implications of some of the, here are some writing standards. And you'll see, you know, even back in kindergarten, with guidance and support from adults, so I should, the coding here is that this is the kindergarten standard, same standard first grade version, same, same standard, standard second, third grade. Uh, with guidance and support from adults, explore a variety of digital tools to produce and publish writing, including in collaboration with peers. There's a little bit of a continuum there. 
So if you look down at the third grade version, with guidance and support from adults, use technology to produce and publish writing using keyboarding skills, as well as to interact and collaborate with others. If you look at the fourth grade standard, which I didn't put up here because there wasn't room on the slide, but it reads, <clears throat> after the third grade language, demonstrate su sufficient command of keyboarding skills to type a minimum of one page in a single, um, to type a minimum or one page in a single city. I'm sorry, a minimum of one page in a single city. Fourth grade. So, all our academic program is in an instructional context where we need to have a supportive school climate. That there's relationships of trust and care between students and teachers especially, between families and teachers, students and families in the school. There's knowledge among staff about um, developmental progressions of learners, that we've got teachers with robust content knowledge and pedagog pedagogical expertise, that we have common core aligned curricular programs, the little p, some of you have heard little p, big p. When we say little p, we're talking about the purchased curricula, like the Lucy Calkins writing curriculum, like Bridges in Mathematics, those are little p. When we talk about big p program, we talk about our math program and the pedagogy associated with it, the curricular materials, um, and everything that goes with it, the professional development. And we need instructional delivery that is aligned to the Common Core State Standards and then it integrates research-based strategy and teacher moves. Teacher moves are, are in quotes there because it's language that we're using more and more these days with the best practices in mathematics course. And it's fun that we're, <clears throat> as administrators, to be sharing in this professional development, sitting with the teachers in this professional development. And there's a lot of focus on, they use the language moves. The teacher is making a move right there. And, and we call out the move. It's a discrete, you know, it's a discrete maneuver. It's a technique. It's a strategy. And that move you just made just increased the um, learning productivity of that moment. So we, we're, that's a, some language I wanted to get out to you. So on-target professional development is a big part of this. And this isn't new information for any of you. But basically, CSSU and CCS professional development foci have been and will continue to be aligned with instructional demands and shifts driven by the Common Core State Standards and research-based best instructional practice. In-service days have been devoted to increasing familiarity and understanding of the Common Core and allowing professionals time to integrate the core into units of study. Uh, school and SUI um, focus in ELA, helping students read and understand more complex tasks, texts, especially informational texts, and helping students to integrate information into clear, coherent writing that demonstrates critical thinking. More on our professional development, and you've heard a lot about our math professional development. But this is just to reiterate that all of our teachers of math are immersed in best, best practices in math coursework. This is research-based coursework. It's a pedagogical focus as opposed to content. We do not talk about bridges. Well, I shouldn't say that. Of course, we talk about bridges because we're talking about the lessons being taught. And we, we are working with the lesson being taught. But the focus isn't on the program or the materials. The focus is on the instructional moves. Um, <clears throat> and the, the instructional practices that are embedded in the best practices are all common core aligned. It's creating a common language throughout the school and district around effective math instruction. And we're noticing, if you ask the best practices in math people about this, they'll say, no, no, no. We can't talk about other impact on other content areas because our program is all about around the research in math. So they get very uncomfortable when you talk about, oh, you should see what we saw in a writing lesson the other day. <clears throat> the teacher was having um, some structured math, some structured talk around the writing, and wow, it was powerful. And they're thrilled to hear it. <clears throat> but what they will tell you is all their research is around math. What Audrey and I are noticing is that these practices and strategies and teacher moves are impacting instruction across the board. Because some of them are just, just Strictly better instructional moves. <clears throat> so we're getting into some of the little P stuff here. 
literacy and language arts. Um, we have we use a readers and writers workshop model. Uh, it's basically the teachers' college balanced literacy approach. Um, we have new Common Core Align Lucy Calkins grade level units. That's uh, this image here is just a, a, an image of those materials. Our word study, we're shifting to the updated Common Core Align version of the Foundations program, uh, which is our K2 uh, word study program. In math, we are um, shifting over to the Common Core Align version of the Bridges and Mathematics program. As most of you know, there's a number corner element of that that's 15 to 20 minutes a day, and then a daily math lesson that's 60 minutes. And then the weekly opportunities to build conceptual math, fact fluency. What we are noticing is that it's, it, we are having a bit of a challenge in terms of finding the instructional minutes and throughout the course of the week to work in that um, uh, computational fact fluency on a regular basis. So that's something that we're, we're continuing to look at. Science. Now this is interesting because uh, many of you might have heard about the NGSS or the Next Generation Science Standards. Those standards are complete. They have been published. Um, we have a plan at CSSU to roll them out. Uh, we're taking it nice and easy under Molly's leadership because of everything else that is going on and because there isn't a, a really tight time push on this in terms of the change in assessment. Um, these are going to be rolled out to staff 2014 and 15 next year. But in the background, science leaders from across the district are meeting and really digging into these new standards. Um, these five bullets you see at the top of the slide here are the five strands of the Vermont GE <coughs> science standard. The Vermont um, Great Expectations in Science. Inquiry, physical science, life science, human body, the universe, earth, and the environment. Um, and our current foci in science are, as outlined in our action plan, we have integration of science notebooks. Um, in the elementary, in the K2, really we're using the language more about journals. We're calling them journals. Um, increased practice and proficiency with inquiry skills. We are implementing the uh, SU-wide science inquiry tasks annually. And of course, we're integrating literacy and math skills into science. History and social sciences otherwise known as social studies. Again, these are the strands, the Vermont GEs. These are not sort of replaced or supplanted by the Common Core. Um, but everything we do in social studies and science is gonna have Common Core aligned um, English language arts instruction, reading and writing. So a big, if you think about kindergarten and second grade, kindergarten through second grade and social studies, uh, an easy way to think about what it is is it's basically in kindergarten, you're kind of getting a sense of self and who I am and what makes me me and I'm different from the person next to me. And then as you get first and second grade, it's the relationship to me, myself, and the people around me in my community and in the world I live in. Uh, the, and the interaction of that. So it's kind of, that's, that's the progression. And that obviously extends through the intermediate grades too. This project, um, this is an example of a project that Kelly Boudelier and uh, Colleen Brady have done. And it's kind of a microcosm of that idea. This is called uh, Me on the Map. And it's a, there's a clip that pins all this together. And in this very small, the smallest circle is a picture of the child or a drawing of the child. And under that is you know, his house, and under that is his town, and under that is Vermont, and under that is the United States, and then North America, and then the planet. So just that sense of the relationship of here I am, and I'm part of this bigger world. Mapping skills are another important part of um, social studies, especially first and second grade. You might notice this if you've been in the uh, 1969 wing lately. This is a project where um, a second grade team is asking for postcards from their students, from any, anybody they know from anywhere in the country, and they're keeping track of where those postcards are coming from, and having discussions about the United States and geography there. 
And here is um, an example of a student who made a, an imaginary, a pretend map, a map of a pretend place. And, but before they could make their map, they had to identify a key. And that's essentially, that's a big picture academic programming K2 at Charlotte. Obviously, um, Common Core is a big driver for us right now. So questions? I have a question, Greg, because I'm already starting to think about the budget. I know that's not what this presentation is about. Yes. But, um, you know, as you have curriculum materials that are realigned with the Common Core, like foundations and, you know, even potentially bridges to what, I mean, what do you see down the line in terms of budget impact? Can you say anything about that now? Yes, I can. Um, we have already made the switch over to the K-2 bridges that's aligned with the Common Core. We plan to make the shift to the, the newer version of the three through five fifth grade bridges. Um, you mean via the supplements or via, I mean I understand that they're like republishing bridges too. Yes, we're talking about the whole kit and caboodle new edition. Okay. We, this year we're using some supplements yeah. so that we can make sure that we're, our content is aligned to the Common Core. Yeah. Next year, teachers will have the new kits in hand. Okay. Um, that will be part of this next budget. However, Audrey and I have talked about, and our math coordinator, Stephanie Sumner, have talked about the advantage of having those materials this fiscal, before this fiscal year ends. So we are going to try to do what we can with um, <coughs> pinching pennies to see if there's a way we can buy these materials this fiscal year, because what we learned last time with the new aligned K2 materials is that it's a bigger shift. They're saying K2 is a bigger shift than 3.5. So that's good news, because K2 was more of a shift than we thought. And the, the two days that we had in the summer unpacking and get to know bridges turned out to be insufficient for teachers. It's really quite different. Um, so we're trying to get the materials in-house this spring so we can be a little bit more ahead of that um, time. And what about the Lucy Calkins writing material? Is that already in? Lucy Calkins writing material is already in. We'd like to buy more versions so people aren't trading back and forth yep. kits. Yep. But we expect to be able to do that without a dramatic impact to the budget. Great. I do think there are technology implications that you'll see in our budget proposal related to this. Won't be anything radically different than last year, but definitely implications. Okay. Thank you. Elaine, this question is for you. You don't have to look at me with the answer because I'm sitting in the wrong place. But what's your perception of the relationship, the evolution, however we want to describe it, no child left behind, common core? I don't necessarily think that the two things are related. Um, I think No Child Left Behind came out of a sense back in like the early 2000s that we had spent as a country a lot of money on Title I and other programs and we had seen no change in closing the achievement gap. So No Child Left Behind really focused on we, need, we, we really need to close the achievement gap and the way we're going to do that is we're going to hold schools accountable. So it was a big stick kind of program. Common Core was an initiative of the 50 state governors and the 50 state either commissioners or secretaries of education who came together and said it would make sense in our country to have some common standards. Um, as we were looking at um, NECAP results, well, we were doing NECAPs, other uh, states were doing other <coughs> kinds of testing, we realized that you couldn't even compare from one state to the next. Um, so that's on one level to have more rigorous standards to kind of uh, think about the 21st century learning skills that we know all kids will need to develop some standards. So that wasn't a federal government thing. That really was the governors, state governors and the um, state commissioners. I think undergirding all of that too is the notion that our kids are very mobile. Even in our own supervisory union, kids move from Charlotte to Hinesburg, maybe to Williston, maybe back to Charlotte, and that happens across the country. And to give kids really a shot at becoming educated 
young adults, we needed to have some sense of what are the basic core things that all kids need. Does that answer? Any other questions? Local tests. How, how do you align the local test exam t test teacher might give in a classroom with the common core? Um, much of that is done little, little P program. So the new Bridges edition that's common core aligned, the assessments are common core aligned. The Lucy Hawkins writing is a, uh, curriculum, all of that is aligned with the common core. The rubrics that we're using to score writing are aligned with the common core in mind. Um, so the local, the fact fluency assessments that we give have been adjusted thanks to a lot of work on the math coordinator's part based on the new common core benchmarks for what kids should be able to do in the different grades, which are actually more rigorous than they were. So that a lot of that work is happening at the SU level. Um, and some of it is built into the new aligned curricular materials. Did I hear you say that the uh, science standards are completed and published, is that? Correct. It's called the NGSS, Next Generation Science Standards. And how did that happen? Who did that? Mm. <laughs> I well, think not presented on that last time. Of expertise, I don't know if you want to jump in there. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I think it's the National Association of Science Educators yeah, I know that worked on those standards. A recent meeting, how those developed, but it was different from the Common Core, though. It is a different. It's a different group, it and it's this whatever the National Organization of Science Educators K sixteen. I think if you go on the website and you put ngss.org, mm -hmm. you can go up and you can see the whole site and it actually shows all the, the new the standards people who developed the people it. who developed it. And you may have explained this. How is that integrated with the Common Core? What's the point here? It's not. The Common Core is ELA and math. Um, with social studies, it's our job to make sure the social studies instruction we're doing is infused with you know common core aligned reading and writing skills that kids can really inquire and read complex text and mm -hmm. write about evidence based in an evidence based way. This complex text on any subject. Correct. Um, and yeah, and the science next generation standards are a separate thing from the common core, but they're going to be more inquiry based and more engineering there's going to be more um, engineering uh, built into it so it will align better with the common core standards than it would have with the Vermont standards but the two of them don't necessarily mm -hmm. link up in I can share just I'm on the committee the study committee for science and we're learning we're learning more about the NGSS and the last meeting we had we actually went online to look at the standards and we're calling performance standards but what they're doing is they're showing the standards and then it shows you a link to the Common Core and how you can link to the ELA and the math pieces. So it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's gonna be integrated. But again, we're still studying as a full committee, mm -hmm. K to 12. So they're, they're trying to do some alignment. So when you go in and look at a standard, we're all excited because you can link and it put, put, put bring up the Common Core standards that you might wanna align to also with your science instruction. So we're right. really excited about that. So while the Common Core doesn't specifically um, target social studies, history, um, science. science, there is an expectation that your students have a certain knowledge of all of these things in order to be able to do the deep reading that you're talking about. So somebody could, if you wanted to spend like the next year, you could go into the Common Core and develop a scope and suite sequence for social studies and for science. It's just that that's not what it's about. It's assuming that that's knowledge that you have and what they're really looking at is can you read, can you write, can you think critically, can you do math? So I should probably know this, but I understand that science kneecaps are continuing for a number of years. Do we know when an NGSS assessment yes. is going to be developed? When is that? 2017 will be the okay. first test. Yes. 2015 will be the last year that they do the science kneecaps. 
So is it a spring, do you know, spring of 2017? That's what we're assuming. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just the other thing, Clyde, on your comment and to follow up with Lane's is the, the focus shift of Common Core language arts of getting kids to be it with the skills to closely read technical and content related texts will support them in learning content in a, mm -hmm. in a deeper mm -hmm. way. So, you know, the two are definitely going to hopefully support one another, but they weren't, they weren't composed in tandem. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really clear, just based on the fifth grade homework we see coming home, that this is this conversion is in full gear. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to 5.0, reports to the board. 5.1, principal's report. Before we go on, sorry. Okay. There's a lot of talk in your presentation about technology, so I presume there are going to be uh, proposals about spending on technology to make this um, that will be required or at least presented as required in order to be able to do all this stuff. You want to give us a hint or is that going to be a surprise <laughs> somewhere down the road? <laughs> I'd be happy to give you a hint. Um, it won't be anything surprising, I don't think. Um, last year, you heard us propose, um, recommend the purchase of a laptop cart for, um, actually, um, we hoped for two laptop carts, and then we brought it down to one laptop cart for use in the third and fourth grade. Currently, the third and fourth grade access to computers, um, or at the time, uh, consisted of three or four classroom computers, PCs, and their access to the lab. So um, I plan on presenting that again, that proposal of a laptop cart for the third and fourth grade team. Um, also, uh, the we have just built into our replacement cycle up in the middle level. This isn't, this isn't new technology. This is just keeping up with our replacement cycle and trying to get a little bit more on top of it. We had originally planned for one replacement of a laptop cart upstairs, um, which is usually around uh, eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars. And what we're finding is we really re need to replace two um, because of the date and condition of a second cart. Um, so that's that's going to be a separate decision packet because that the one replacement would be in, in the context of our regular technology budget because it was a planned. But the replacement of the second would be in addition. That one isn't so much related to the Common Core. That's just in, related to kids need access to reliable um, technology and devices that aren't a hindrance to what they're when they're showing what they're knowing. Um, I will tell you though, not on the technology front, but on the programmatic front, I do plan on bringing to the board again a proposal for full day kindergarten um, because I I am seeing more and more. Um, this year, all the information that the kindergarten study committee came to last year, none of which is, you know, really new information for anybody. Um, but this year, I, I'm seeing it play out um, and watching these standards uh, come to come to life at school and, and thinking about our program in kindergarten, and more and more think that um, we're we're not doing our kindergartners any favors by having them start with four months of a half-day program. And uh, what I'm seeing is our kindergarten teachers are having to make decisions on a weekly basis about what not to teach. Uh, you know, what are we not gonna cover today? And, and I'm seeing those professionals in, in a funny feeling about that. And, you know, looking to me like, you know, Greg, we're making these decisions. We've got these new expectations and standards and, and I'm just telling them, you guys do a great job, and, and, and we have, you know, so that, that is going to be included, and it does very much relate to this presentation, but it's not, it's not necessarily related to um, technology hardware. Getting back to the computers, it came up last year when we were talking about these issues. There was some um, vagueness about 
the aspects in terms of their, what they require. In terms of mm -hmm. So now the answer is you simply have to have a computer for every person to do that, or how does it work? No, no, we're not proposing going one to one computer for every student. We just, um, we don't know exactly how many students are going to be taking the test at one time. We know there'll be a, a, a window in which you can get the assessments done. Um, we know that we'll, we'll, we're not worried about necessarily having the, un, the adequate number of devices in the school. We think that we're set, we'll be pretty well set with that. So, um, but programmatically, we are concerned that our younger students, especially third and fourth graders, aren't having enough experiences and in interfacing with the technology that it's, it's not going to feel like a pencil and a paper. It's going to feel like I'm in front of this new thing and I'm being asked to show what I know. So, um, but no, there's no, there's no indication that we're required to have one-on-one, -on -one, enough computers for everybody. The testing is expected to be staggered. We don't know exactly but how many kids are going to be assessing at one time. We've heard that the best so far, I spoke to a principal a couple weeks ago who said when they did the pilot, they did a third of their kids on desktops. This is very smart. A third of the kids on laptops and a third of the kids on, on uh, tablets or iPads to see how it would play out. And they said overwhelmingly the laptops were the preferred yeah. platform because you weren't kind of stuck at the station. You were in your own classroom. And the tablets, because of the viewing space, wasn't as ideal. And we found the yeah, same thing as the fifth sure graders. Fifth, fifth grade, we piloted um, the ELA portion uh, last year for SBAC, and we used laptops. We used the laptop cart in fifth grade with the students, and so we we had them use um, headphones, and they preferred that and felt more at ease with that because they used them so much on a daily basis. They were comfortable in taking the pilot with that and prefer doing it rather than going to the lab. Are using tablets and we didn't have any for that but, or a and desktop. The fourth graders took it in the lab at, at PCs, you know, similar to the one over there. And uh, we noticed that some of them were, were pretty stressed and, mm -hmm. and found it long yeah. um, sitting, you know, this far away from the person next to them. And, and you know, on a, in a. So. And so the period testing interval yes. will be the determinant of how many devices you need. Yes, but I just want to reiterate, I don't think we're going to be making big decisions about devices based on SBAC. I think the device, the number of devices at Charlotte is going to be probably adequate. We're going to be, we're moving away from netbooks. We're looking at laptops to be the preferred platform in terms of kids to be interfacing with. We're going to continue to get more tablets that um, each budget cycle that, that can be deployed in classrooms that teachers can sign out. Um, but it's going to be more of programmatic decisions around access and integration as opposed to we need this many so that kids can take the test. Thank you. All right. 5.0 for real this time. Reports to the board. 5.1 principal's report. Um, does anyone have any questions for Greg or Audrey on the principal's report? Or anything you want to highlight? It's pretty short. Okay. All right, thank you. 5.2 CSSU debrief. debrief. <coughs> um, and I think everyone was there. Everyone here was there. Um, it was a great presentation, I thought, by Laura mm -hmm. Soros. Mm -hmm. Um, discussing the complexity of health insurance. Um, and if you weren't there, I recommend you um, watch on RETN. Uh, moving on to 5.4, administrative structure. And this is Elaine. Yeah, so um, here's what I have is the charge that the board gave me last spring during the budget cycle. So charge to Superintendent Pinckney, provide the board with a five-year plan for CCS administrative structure and specifically determine whether changes in administrative structure are warranted given the reduced number of pupils and staff. So let's just start with that. Does that sound to you like that's what you asked me to do? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's my plan, and then we can discuss whether you think there are any you know, elements missing. 
So I would elicit from the board and staff their expectations for leadership at Charlotte Central School. Because depending on what you want, if you want somebody to just open the door and make sure that the teachers are there and whatever, that's a different thing than if you're looking for instructional leaders. And Secondly, then elicit from the staff their opinions regarding the efficacy of co-principal versus principal assistant principal model through in, um, in-person communications, emails, and an anonymous survey. So I would do a survey monkey. So I've already scheduled yesterday to go there after their work session. So they had a work session, so I'd schedule that I would be there if they wanted to talk to me. I will be there again tomorrow at 3. And I've already asked them if they wanted to send me an email. They couldn't. I've gotten two emails. And I will do a um, survey monkey. So that would be an anonymous survey for people to give their opinion. Interview the current administration separately. Review statewide data and administrator ratio. So the way I'm doing that, I've already started doing that work. I'm looking at it as, okay, when we look at the K-8s in Vermont, what's the average enrollment and how many principals, and then which ones fall so with specific information. And then I also looked at it as uh, pre-K-4 and 5-8 schools, as if Charlotte had two schools, and looked at, well, what are the numbers for Charlotte? There are two schools. So in Charlotte, pre-K-4, you have 231. In 5-8, you have 194. What is that average in Vermont when you look at pre-K-4 and 5-8 schools? What's the ratio there? So I would share that with you and show you the schools that are, what the numbers are. Review the research liter literature, say. So what does the research tell us about the importance of instructional leadership on student success specifically? And what, if anything, does the research tell us about optimal administrator ratios? I can tell you I've started doing that a little bit, and that is almost impossible to find. Um, and then provide a recommendation to the board on administrative structure for 2015 through 2018, based on the Bill Smith numbers so does that sound like what you were hoping for? Now does it factor in at all special ed or that's just totally out of the equation since special it's, education's right. at the SEO? Yeah, I think it pretty much factors that out. Okay. Especially when I'm looking at the state because there's so many different models. If we factor special ed in, I don't know what to compare to. Most um, supervised reunions do not have building level special ed administrators. Those people are at the SU so instead of just there being a Megan at the SU, there's a Megan and three other people, and then she deploys them. Um, our model is to have people locally. So to compare our model then to somebody else's is a difficult thing. Okay, so the, but the expectation would be that if there was a feeling that that had to change, if we needed more, if we needed less, we would be hearing from you via Megan that Right. So right that, now, that you know yes. you need a point eight instead of point five, or you need only need a point right. four. So the way we're doing that right now, going into this for the first time this year, is we said let's assume that Williston and CVU, our biggest schools, you know, twelve to fourteen hundred kids, that's one point FTE special ed administrator. What does that mean for everybody else? So you guys are exactly at the right place. Some other school might have too much in terms of, not too much in terms of what they need for administration, but too much in terms of what they're going to get reimbursed by the state. And so those are the kinds of things that we're going to have to figure out. Okay. So as you're looking at administrator to teacher ratios, are you going to pull out the special educators from the, that? Um, because they're supervised the ratio by someone I'm else. looking at is not administrator to teacher, it's administrator, it's administrator to, to the enrollment. That's okay. what the state gives okay. you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so then that's not a factor. Although uh, the education quality standards, the education quality standards, mm -hmm. they do provide an administrator to teacher yes, FTE they do. ratio. And I can share also. that too. Yeah. I will share that. Yeah. And maybe, yeah. Yeah. And what are your discriminators? regarding efficacy and efficiency? I mean, so you know that this school has this ratio and that school has that ratio. I'm going to tell you so what, what the schools are and I'm going to let you make your decisions yourself. But well, I don't know what you're asking me because I'm, I'm not going to go for, visit those schools to see. I'm asking for meaningful numbers in terms of the 
outcomes of the students relative to the administrative oh. structure. I mean, oh. what you've laid out for us there is, is strictly right. uh, yeah, A, yeah. Vermont based, which is shaky to begin with, mm -hmm. and B, um, there's no, it's not based on anything other than people's opinions, is basically what. Well, all this tells us. you is what is. It's not an opinion. It's like here are all the 5 8 schools, how many of them there are, what's the average enrollment in the 5 8 schools, what, how many administrators they have for that enrollment. And then here are some schools that fit in that cluster about that enrollment and how many administrators they have. And it wouldn't be that hard for me to do the next thing, just time consuming, to say, okay, well then, how did those particular schools score on the kneecap? But you know what? I can tell you right now what you're going to get out of that. Sherla is tops on the kneecap, so you're always going to be better than. And we were before we did. Yeah, so I'm just saying that. Well, I think part of it is we asked for this after we got the five-year plan for, for reducing school. faculty. Yeah. So it was if we're reducing faculty, should we look at the administrative structure? Should there, if we're paring down faculty, you know, does that mm -hmm. warrant looking at whether or not we should pare right. down administration? So I think that's mm -hmm. why looking at the student numbers, because that's what drove the right. the reduced number of faculty or right. the proposed and so when, you faculty. Think, when you're making the decision about um, faculty, you're thinking about what are the class sizes and what's uh, an average class size and what's a reasonable class size and what's an effective class size, and that is up for discussion too, right? And same thing with administrators. So we're doing kind of the same thing. We're looking at what is the right ratio of, and, and really, your point is well taken. It's not just of students. It's a re what is the ratio of administrator to teacher? Because the work that you want administrators to do, that instructional leadership, that supervision and evaluation, that leverages student learning, that makes a heck of a difference if they've got like 30 per administrator, or if they have 10 per administrator. It's, I acknowledge I'm going to lose this discussion. Um, but as I said, it's not based on anything. I mean, it's just, it's, um, this is what those people do, this is what these people do, let me finish. Right. This is what those people think mm -hmm. about it. You know, you refer to the kneecaps, well, apparently the kneecaps weren't all that hot because they're going to disappear. So every time you renorm a test, and that's what the disappearance mm -hmm. of the kneecaps is, is just renorming of tests, you, have, you introduce a whole new right. set of variables where you didn't have any solid footing in the first place. And this, it's... I wasn't going to bring the kneecaps into it. Myself. <laughs> this is based on Vermont and even more than Vermont CSSU. So <coughs> it's insular. Mm -hmm. um, but it is not based on CSSU. It really is based on Vermont. But that is just one element. The element of what are the numbers, because I think it's important for you to see how do we compare to other people in terms of numbers. But it is also going to be based on what is the best research out there around school leadership. And I think it's the Wallace Foundation. It is, oh, guess what, Wallace Foundation, again, Learning Point, and uh, who is this, Educational Research. So I think that the information in here about what, what, you, what you're expecting administrators to do and how that leverages learning for your students is the important kind of research part of this. And then you'll just see what the numbers are. And May I see those? Yeah. Any other questions so or how about concerns? I mean, do you guys think it's important to see what other schools in the state are doing? And yes. I mean, you can do whatever you want with it once I show it yeah. to you. But I mean, I personally don't think looking at the kneecaps is that helpful. And I think, yeah. as you said, it's really hard to know if, if we knew having you know, this, mm -hmm. you know, having two principals would make every school, it's, that's just one factor. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's probably a, a practical thing, too, in terms of if you're looking at, well, uh, co-principals or a principal and an assistant, and what does that mean in terms of uh, the budget, right? Because that's one of the factors you want to consider, too. 
And what does that mean for continuity for how long you keep an yeah, assistant? So some of the research is going to tell you that you know principals need to stay there for about six years before, not before, but to have the optimal impact. I think the combination of data that you're proposing to collect is that's good. Okay. If anybody thinks of anything else that they hope I can get, and it's, I can get it, I will. Just for the record, note that I'm accepting myself from that evaluation. I don't think that we're going to learn anything meaningful from what the course we're pursuing here. So do you have some other things that you we'll think would make it more meaningful? I would take a broader look at national models, but also internet. I mean, you don't have time. If it's easy really for me to, to get it. this kind of a study. Mm -hmm. um, But numbers, ratios, that kind of thing nationally. Is that what you're saying? Well, it has to be, I mean, there's so many, it has to be tied to outcomes. And so then the question well, that arises, I can. Yeah. well, that's the point. Mm -hmm. But you know, again, just, Charlotte's going to be at the top of the heap no matter what. And leadership, you know what one of these books says right here? This, I think it's this one. That's going to tell you that second to the classroom teacher, leadership has the most impact on student learning. Well, I'm and sure I that think that potentially it can have even a greater impact because absent leadership, people just do their own thing. They shut the door, they do their own thing. And so now your kid might have a great first grade teacher who's really paying attention to the common core and next gen science standards and what technology needs to happen. Great, you're so happy. And then second grade, maybe your kid is in a class where they do sailboats all year. And, it's, and, and there's research around that too, that if your kid gets a bad teacher in that string, that reduces the, success of the, uh, the academic success of the student permanently. Uh, I hope we would all deduce that without having to be given that information. I mean, the, the fact is that that's what leadership does, though. They ensure that we don't have those ebbs and flows of um, well, the question excellence in the classrooms. We then return to the question of what administrative structure is required that's what we're to ensure to. that. Right. right. And we've already established that we have two conflicting sets of data, pre two principles and after two principles. And in both cases, Shalal was at the top of the heap. I think it's time to move on to the next. If you think subject. of anything, though, that you think I could get, I would be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. 5.5. Um, or did you have anything you wanted to add? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Union versus non-union comparison. Um, how do you mean? In a union school. Oh. Teachers, union administrators versus like a private school that has not the constraints and what their administrators are, what their mm -hmm. testimonies are. Mm -hmm. So do you mean like public versus private, or do you also just mean union, non-union within? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can look at that. I don't know what I will. Just speaking historically from where my kids came from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Were your kids in? They were in private schools in Los Angeles, not in the public school system there. Mm -hmm. Which I presume was a non-union city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just say one thing. I, what would be useful to me is um, to have, you know, a rich discussion of what other options that we have, right? Mm -hmm. Because. Clyde's made the obvious point that uh, it's hard to quantify um, mm -hmm. subjective mm -hmm. data, right? So we're not building a bridge. So it, you know, Clyde's never going to get the right. information that he wants to any level mm -hmm. of precision because this is mm -hmm. something where there's not a con it's not like a scientific experiment. There's no control. Right. You can compare apples and oranges in public schools and private schools and. There's so many other factors at play. You know, Charlotte comes up at the top of the heap in kneecaps. Um, you know, there are other factors besides 
-hmm. administrative structure, the teaching structure, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff that you can't really tease apart from the data. So um, I, certainly no harm done in, in gathering that information. Um, but for us to just kind of look at what our options are mm -hmm. and what the relative costs are, what the relative, um, what our expectations are based on, and, and I'm open to subjective interpretations. Mm -hmm. If you tell us you've seen two or three examples uh, mm -hmm. in your own personal experience, uh, that to me would uh, carry some weight as much as sort of mm -hmm. data which is influenced by so many other factors that it's really hard to, to, to point down. Okay, anything else? All right, thanks, Elaine. 5.5 first quarter financial management report. Um, I don't know if people have questions or comments. Bob is available if we need him. Um, obviously, we wish we were not in a $38,000 unfavorable position, but. Um, And it's because of the revenues, I'm mm -hmm. noticing. So any questions or comments? Okay, hopefully that becomes favorable soon. Uh, moving on, 6.0, discussion matters, 6.1 budget. And 6.1.1, forum preparation, November 19th, 6 p.m. Um, I, I was planning that I will uh, update the slide presentation from last year. I'll try to get it out well in advance so people can find errors or make suggestions for additions. Is there anything else that people want to do with that at the forum beyond the slideshow? Does anyone want to do it instead of me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get Lynn or Patrice to come back. And, um, I, I, expect, I expect I will be unable to answer audience questions, but you know, hopefully others will be there to help. Um, all right, so I will try to work on that since we have some um, information from Bob, and I'll send it out as soon as I can so you can have a chance to look at it ahead. Will we have Bob there? What's the date? The it's the half hour prior to our regular oh, yeah. budget yes. meeting. So if Bob can be there, okay. I think you don't have to be so scared about questions. Um, <laughs> <No. laughs> uh, 6.1.2 budget buddies. Last year we um, had Jenny and Abby as budget buddies. A number of, I don't know if all the other school boards have budget buddies or not. Um, so we put it on to discuss whether or not uh, we want to do that again. So I open that up to the board. It's a good idea if you get people who are engaged. Okay. Um, people liked it. Jenny, I mean, maybe liked it's too strong a word. She uh, enjoyed learning the process. Mm -hmm. I know that for a fact. I thought it was positive. Um, I know Abby had some frustration that she felt like they came in too late in the process and there wasn't enough opportunity to really research the questions that you know she had in mind and I'm sorry do I keep kicking you over the table um, we kind of feel like that too it always yeah. seems like we're coming right right, <laughs> right. yeah I mean the bigger foundational questions about you know potential changes to the school and that kind of thing there it's not a sustained process for those kinds of conversations um, and it wouldn't be now either because nothing's really changed but I still think they're their communications were helpful, their questions were helpful. I don't see any reason not to do it. I don't think Abby would maybe do it again, but we could, you know, ask And people. I think last year we prompted, I think last year we solicited in the newsletter and then Charlotte News, um, do we want to do that same way? Just ask, I think we only had two people interested last year and that's how many budget buddies we had, so. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, could we then uh, seek out people? Yeah. You know, if we had someone in mind or, you know. Recruit. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. I think it would be good to do both. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. You mean in oh, no, addition mean, to advertising. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, but if you yeah. know someone is interested and is good in budgeting, that would be I great. Or so, yeah. You can try to. Stronger, yeah. All right. Is well, there a limit to how many we want? Probably at some point. Yeah. I'd I say mean, I don't, you don't anticipate most, a crowd showing up, but. There should be more bud board members than budget buddies. Yeah, I think so, too. So let's say we'll hope for it to get maybe two or three <clears> then. <throat> Um, okay, so I'll get I'll get in touch with the news and with Naomi about putting something in the newsletter, um, and as soon as I get any names, I guess I'll pass them along ahead of time. Um, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on like the time frame. Uh, I don't admit, I mean we, I don't think we can get anybody in place before um, the forum, so I guess we can. We'll have to play that part by ear. All right, 6.2. Well, one thing we could say, though, in the publicity for it is that. Please come if, to the forum. Please come <laughs> to the forum if you're interested. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good point. Uh, all right, 6.2 communications, board's corner. And Brett was kind enough to forward me the um, publication schedule. I didn't bring it, print it out or bring it with me. Um, but do we have an idea for something that we want as our next submission? Do we want it to be about the budget? Do we want to take a break? Do we want to? I think it could be an outline of what our budget process and dates will be in. Okay. Does that seem? Do we have follow ideas? up on the facility stuff, or is that going to be to death? There is going to be an article in Citizen this week. Uh, and I know Brett is writing something uh, for the Charlotte News as well. Um, not for me. This is uh, I know they're publishing their own, so maybe we should wait for those and see what we go from there. And truthfully, we haven't made a lot of decisions. So. Right. And remember, yeah, remember, we're supposed to get questions. Yeah, tomorrow. if anybody has questions, I'm still waiting. <laughs> or things that you want that we want the committee to figure out. Although that's 6.3. So 6.2. So I will draft up something about the budget process and send it around. Um, unless somebody else Thank you. wants to. Uh, all right, moving on. 6.3 facilities. Mark. I have nothing to add. Uh, I haven't uh, gotten any questions from anybody willing to entertain them. Um, encouraged. Uh, have not had any feedback at all from the forum last time, other than getting a call from someone at the Citizen asking we completed one of those questions prior to December, wasn't that? Yeah, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm just, whatever so I've got quite to. a few, I just haven't finished it yet. Yeah, that's, so. okay. that's fine. Great. Uh, so, um, and I just, I think this is going to be an ongoing conversation for some time, so. Um. And we'll be reminded next week at our budget meeting, if we haven't yet worked out questions for Mark, that yeah. can help remind us again. But yeah, if he can get them before their, the next facilities meeting, that would be good. The committee is meeting um, on the Monday 18th. We have a meeting, our regular meeting on the 18th, but we'll also have our, our next regular meeting at the beginning of December. So, okay. Great. All right. 7.0 action matters. 7.1 approve purchase services. Do I have a motion to approve purchase well, services? That was taken off the time. Uh, so moved. Have a second. Any discussion? These are the um, the services that we um, have traditionally chosen to purchase through the SDO. Um, we're not required to, but previous boards have found it's more cost effective and less of a hassle to do it that way. But we are not required. So, is there any discussion? Any questions? All, that. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstention? No, I didn't hear <laughs> Okay. Uh, 7.2, approval of third grade field trip to Biodome, Montreal. Do you have a motion to approve the third grade field trip? So moved. So moved. That's the second. second. Um, any discussion? 
We have, have to approve it because it's out of the country. Driving has it in there. It's Cher. She takes a bus. She works on it. It's an annual thing. She she works on it months in advance. It's a very complicated process, but she has it down in terms of calling the border, you know, a couple weeks in advance and then a couple days in advance. And Having already sent in my check for this, field, <laughs> um, I can tell you that it's very detailed. It's a three-page field trip. Uh, very detailed, <laughs> how they get across, when, um, when they're going, how many parents they need. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, this is like moving armies. <laughs> She's but, very uh, organized with that. Uh, yes. And uh, the kids are psyched. So we probably have a bunch of third graders here next time. And it's a tradition. It's a charter bus. Yeah, it's a charter. They, yeah, they take a, they take a charter bus. It's not just a school bus. <laughs> with bathroom. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 8.0, consent agenda. <coughs> Is there a need to pull anything out? All right. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And I guess, do you have the order, Sandy? Thank you. 9.0 director's comments. Do you want to go first, Clyde? Uh, sure. Would you give that to the chair, please? What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason I moved this to director's comments is because, unlike last year, I didn't take a lot of notes. Everything is on their website, and okay. most of it's not worth looking at, with the exception of they did provide a statistical abstract of where education is in Vermont, number of students, cost, performance outcomes. It's interesting to look at. It's uh, fact-based. Beyond that, it's a little tough to know where to begin. You have to remember. There are 272 school boards in Vermont. There were 38 represented at this meeting. Mm. So before I go on, let me sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. You guys should all go. Um, because it's the best that there is. I mean, it's all that there is. The other side of that coin is if you go, you realize that um, educational philosophy in Vermont has essentially been co-opted, some might say hijacked, by a particular mindset and a particular agenda, to wit, one of the speakers at this thing was the director of the Vermont ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Folks, I fail to understand what the fact that Thomas Jefferson had slaves has to do with any of the stuff that we talked about tonight. I mean, it's, it's getting a little bizarre. And to tie this in, I think we were all there for Laura's comments, which was a very interesting presentation. But if you hearken back to what she said and think about the number of times you heard the phrase, I don't know, when you were looking for substantive answers from people who should know, like this fellow Johnson, who is the, uh, what is his role? I forget, but the, the seminar that I went to with him was about Act 77. Everybody knows what Act 77 is. Act 77 is the law that's going to require every student to have an individualized learning program. The phrase, I don't know, came up over and over again uh, when the fellow was asked questions about the implications of various parts of the law. And what that translates into is that there's a bureaucracy that will make administrative decisions that really are the substance of the law rather than the legislature, legislation itself. 
which means that these folks will be free to determine, for example, what constitutes an individual learning program. And you may think, so what? But that has the potential to be a phenomenally expensive procedure. And so when you hear these people say they don't know what the answer is in regards to legislation that has been passed, um, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to ignore it and just kind of take your word for it, or they're really going to pay attention to it, in which case it'll probably give the expression, cost has no meaning, a new meaning. It'll just be expensive beyond belief. Um, an awful lot of the, the uh, discussion was student presentations, which of course your gut reaction is that's a good thing, but when that's all that there is, you get pretty quickly the idea that, okay, we're talking about individual achievement. You don't need to hear about it from every school district in the state. That's an exaggeration, but the point is they fell back on that um, excessively rather than, for example, the book that Elaine gave you, this fellow, uh, Nathan Levinson, Work Smarter. Do you know, recall the title? That you gave me tonight? Smarter budgets, smarter schools. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting book because there are facts and there's information in it. But this fellow only got to talk for about an hour. And he was the, quote, keynote speaker. Um, so if you were looking for substance and information and knowledge that could help you create a smarter school, um, you didn't get it. For example, relative to the conversation that I was having with Elaine. Um, class size. This fellow refers to the fact that 30 years of research demonstrates class size has almost nothing to do with student achievement. On the other hand, it's a major linchpin of how we approach our budget. So I go on for a long time, and the point is this. Um, you need to go, you need to hear the conversations, you need to see what people are thinking about. Um, but you have to understand that um, substantive thought with these folks is in decline. Um, so my net for my trip to the school board convention is it was interesting. Um, I am getting a little tired of hearing the governor's Claire Oglesby story. Has everybody heard it? I've heard it every time, every time the guy speaks, and that's five times now. It always begins with that. And we hear about how he was dyslexic and You know, where's the beef, for those of you who remember those advertisements? Uh, where are the things that we can use to actually improve education. So it was a little frustrating this year, to be quite honest. Any questions? Uh, well, I'm sorry, this doesn't address the substance of what you said, but are they ever going to move it out of Lake Maury? I hope not, more because Lake that's Maury? the best part of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Have you folks ever been to Lake Maury? It's a beautiful place in the fall. Um, awesome. It's way it ahead it's of the far. Burlington Sheraton. Yeah, it is a long hike, um, but the answer is I don't think so because I think it's cost effective yeah. for them there. Yeah. All right, thank you. Any other director's comments? Just, uh, just a quick one. Um, I flipped through a copy of Seven Days newspaper today, and there's an interesting article in there today about, uh, I only got to read about half of it before I had to get going, uh, but I have it. It's about Windsor, Vermont, and to what they're facing, their school board is facing. Uh, they've been up for their budget seven times and have failed each time and still are operating without a school budget right now. So it was an interesting read to see uh, striking the balance between what 
the town and providing quality education. So uh, just encourage, I, I will finish it myself, but uh, it was an interesting read for the little piece I got to read before I had to get going. So. Are they approaching the limit? I, I don't know. I uh, did not get, uh, I, I don't know what the limit is. Probably another couple months, so well, yeah. Yeah, so the, I mean, one of the points I did get is it's been 20 years since any school district has gotten this far along without a, without a budget, so. Hmm. Just, uh, I, I wasn't aware of that. But neither was I. I hadn't heard a thing about it. It's a, a, I'm not even exactly sure what Windsor is. Was it a big increase? I mean, what was the, what's the problem? No, in fact, it was, uh, oh, no, I take that back. I forget the exact increase. It was a significant them. increase. They've come down each time, obviously, uh, and still can't get it through hmm. by, by significant margins, percentages. Uh, and I'll just keep talking if you want. They did pass it the first time. It got through the first time, and then there was a uh, um, petition to, to re vote. So. so it must have been close the first time. It was close the first time. But hmm. Erica, Erica Rodora. I guess my only is I'm not a crafter myself, but the PTO's craft yeah. fair is Saturday, including a PTO bake sale. So if you are so inclined, you should go because that helps support a lot of things that we can't pay for through our regular budget, is um, supplemented by funds raised by the PTO. All right, 10.0, confirm next meeting dates. There's quite a few. Um, November 19th is our budget forum at 6, followed by the budget, a budget meeting at 6.30, and that will be at CCS in the library. We have another budget meeting December 3rd at 6.30, also at the CCS library, December 17th. Budget meeting at 6.30 in the CCS library, and January 7th and 14th. Um, 6.30 on the 7th in the library, 6 o'clock on the 14th, that'll be the hearing on approval of the final budget. Um, we have CSSU meetings December 18th at 5.30, a budget meeting, and that's at the central office. The meeting, but not another budget meeting, oh, I'm sorry, the dates are <laughs> backwards, but there's also a budget meeting November 20th at 5.30, also at central office and a board chair's meeting. All right, 11.0 negotiations, 11.1, I guess this is you. I don't, I don't have anything to say okay. other than what was in, um, said in executive session. But, um, I don't know if this is intended to be a placeholder, perhaps. Okay. Is there um, any need to go into executive session? I don't think so. I mean, we did that before the meeting. So, is there? Does anyone see a need to go into executive session prior to um, the next negotiations meeting, which is the uh, which is the nineteenth, right? Right. It's the same night as our budget. Form. Oh, so let me think about this for a second. Hold on. You mean now? Right. I have a question based on what Laura was saying that I think boy I think it's executive session because it'll it will it could bear on not that I it could bear on strategy Okay. Which You're talking about employee contribution to health care kind of question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I guess the answer is yes. Okay. I have indeed. So do you want to move into it? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. We are going into executive session. I can't.